Good evening, everyone. We are so pleased to have you join us tonight for today's webinar with Accelerate Yale, Modernizing the Traditional Ballet Point Shoe, a conversation with Eliza Minden, co-founder and designer, Gaynor Minden. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Wendy Maldonado D'Amico, and I'm Yale College class of 1993. I'm so excited to co-host tonight's session with you. This session is co-sponsored by Yale Women and Yale Museums Arts and Culture. Accelerate Yale is a global community of diverse alumni and friends of Yale engaged in innovation, tech, and entrepreneurship. Our mission is to cultivate an active, inclusive ecosystem that thoughtfully promotes meaningful connections and collaborations, while also serving as a bridge between alumni and current Yale students. We encourage all of our webinar participants to drop their names and contact info into the chat so we can see who is here. Please note that today's session is being recorded and all participants will be muted. We will be running a one hour session and we'll reserve the final 20 to 25 minutes for your questions. If you have a question that you'd like to submit, please use that Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. And now I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator for tonight's conversation, Tanya Rivera-Warren. Tanya is Yale College class of 1995 and a graduate of the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. She is a news anchor and correspondent for CBS News, where she anchors a live show at 12 noon Eastern, Monday through Friday on CBS News Streaming. Before college, she danced professionally with the New York City Ballet. Tanya, over to you. Thank you so much, Wendy, for that lovely introduction. I'm so excited to be uh, interviewing Eliza Minden because I had heard so much about her point shoe as a professional dancer, but about the time that the point shoe was launched was about the time I was leaving ballet. So unfortunately, I never got to try it as a dancer, but I've always been curious about it. Was excited to hear she was a fellow Yaley. So this is so fun for me. Um, Eliza, welcome. I'm going to just dive right in with the first question that came to me when I thought about you and what you've accomplished was, what was it that led you to want to disrupt an industry as old and niche as the point shoe industry? Is there something unique about your background or your circumstances that led you to that place? Well, thank you, Tanya. Um, the short answer to your question is sore toes. Like every ballet student, I could not wait until the great day when I would be allowed to go on point, which was a privilege that I had worked hard for. And when that day came, I was kind of devastated at how painful it was. And I persevered, but I never forgot or forgave that particular pain. And then uh, as I got older, I realized a few more things that made me think the point shoe needed to be improved. Um, my mother is a ballet teacher. She founded a ballet school. There was a studio in our home growing up. My late sister danced professionally. So I was surrounded by sore toes and also by some injuries that I believed were avoidable. Um, I also went to the ballet all the time in New York uh, during the great days in the 1970s when there were a lot of exciting and inspiring performances. And when the court of ballet would enter and sound like artillery fire, you know, it really destroyed the, um, the, the illusion of effortless grace that dancers work so hard to achieve. And the fourth reason was the one that I think most people sit up when they hear, and that is that many point shoes last only one performance. I'm sure you know all about that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the single use point shoe is a real problem for not-for-profit companies that have to buy them, for dancers, parents, for everybody. So those things um, made me think that we could do better. And in addition to my mother being all about ballet, my family's business is manufacturing. My father started a company to produce his father's inventions, which are energy efficient wiring devices. So, and I, had, I grew up there, I worked there. So I was familiar with injection molding machines and the struggles of running a small business and how you might develop a product and apply for a patent. So our family dinner table was really the perfect place for this. On the one hand, we talk about how great Barishnikov was last night. And on the other hand, you know, oh, too bad the number four molding machine is down again. What are you going to do? <laughs> and then finally, everybody in the family loves sports. And we did a lot of skiing and sailing. And those are things that involve a lot of gear 
and I had personally experienced the great improvements in footwear, clothing, and equipment for those sports uh, myself. And that's something most dancers don't do. As, as I'm sure you know, a lot of dancers aren't even allowed to ski. So they were not aware of, they hadn't had the personal experience of the transformative uh, things that can happen when modern materials are introduced into your, into your equipment. Absolutely. And so tell us about the process of creating the prototype of your point to testing it. I mean, was your sister your, your main model? I mean, how, how did you go through that process of creating the Gaynor Minden point shoe? Well, first there was the competitive analysis. Uh, and in my case, this meant buying every point shoe on the market and borrowing my brother's band saw and cutting them open. Uh, and I think my brother has now only now forgiven me for messing up the blade of his band saw <laughs> with all that satin. And what I found just, just appalled me. Shoe after shoe was made of cardboard, leatherboard, paper, paste, little nails, even newspaper. And in fact, I can show you one now. I hope this, yeah. this is cardboard, paper, paste. Um, they're basically flimsy paper materials. Then, so no wonder they last only one performance. So when I saw that, I realized that those materials had been taken as far as they could go. And I had to look to modern materials, but fortunately they were already there. It was just a matter of a lot of research in those pre-internet days of finding materials that might be suitable. And this meant picking up the phone and calling plastics companies. And this, this was like that scene in The Graduate where you, the uncle says to Benjamin, I have one word for you, um, plastics. So I looked into plastics. And uh, inevitably I would find after a few false starts, some guy was always a guy at a plastics company who had a wife or a daughter or a girlfriend who danced. So when I told him what I just told you about lasting one performance, he said, oh yeah, I know about that. And maybe you'd like to try this material or that material and let me send you some samples. So I'd get these samples that come in plaques of a 16th or an eighth or, or a half an inch thick. And I would flex them in my hands like this. And when I found ones that thought, well, this, this might work, I kept that in mind. And in the meantime, I started trying to figure out what the dimensions would be. And I used my own foot. Uh, and I, I also mapped the point shoe into zones. So I can do some more show and tell here. Um, I looked at which part of the shoe had to be flexible and which part had to be stiff. So, so you want it to be very flexible here, Arch, yeah. but stiff, stiffer here. And you want it to bend in one direction here, but not bend in another direction, in another place. So I had to map all that out and uh, adjust the thicknesses of the materials to do that and their curvatures. Uh, before I made an injection mold, which is an investment, uh, I went to a, a tool maker who made me a prototype mold. And interestingly, I found this guy from a classmate who had an interesting business making uh, supplies for lobstermen in Maine. Lobster traps are typically made of wood, but there are plastic components, the buoy spindles and the escape valves and things. Uh, so I went to this tool maker and he made a prototype mold into which we cast urethane. So it was a, was a two part process. Uh, it would set up chemically overnight, very slow, but I would get uh, my, my uh, idea for a midsole and toe box. And that looks something like this. This is the injection molded one, but this is the basic shape of the part we're looking at. And so after testing that and making shoes with that, um, I made an injection mold, but the making shoes part was, was kind of amusing too, because I had to find a place that would make that would take this plastic part that I had uh, adhered shock absorbing foam and tool for cushioning and comfort and noise reduction and wrap it in pink satin and put an outer sole on it. But I found in the phone book, uh, a place that said, we, we will make any shoes at all. We make Mike Tyson's boxing shoes. We make booties for Park Avenue poodles. We, we will never turn a job down. And so I saw those guys. And they would make one prototype at a time, which I would then, yes, ask my sister to try on after I tried it on. And if she said it was okay, I'd go to ballet studios in New York City. And I, I was like Prince Charming looking for Cinderella. You know, would, would you try on this shoe? Does it fit you? Um, and I got you know, one at a time feedback 
like that until I got confident enough to order a pair. And once I got, once that you know, went pretty well, constantly revising the inside parts, um, we began to think it might be time to actually look for a factory and go into production. Amazing. And as soon as you did, and you you got dancers, professional dancers to actually try your shoe and dance with it, you had some pretty immediate success. Uh, you know, you had big, big dancers um, from some big companies, big names using your shoe and, and loving it. But, you know, I, I'm curious, I wish you can talk a little bit about the, the difficulties you had sort of breaking into, you know, the ballet world, as I know well, can be very insular. It can be uh, very intimate. Um, and so this idea of reinventing a part of this traditional art form can be hard for some, you know, dancers and company directors to sort of understand or wrap their heads around. So can you tell us about some of the challenges that you have faced? Because now, you know, your, your shoes are sold in 80 countries. I believe that's correct. Is that correct, Eliza? Is it 80? All around the world. Um, so clearly they're very well accepted. But what were some of the challenges that you had to sort of break into that insular world? Well, at first there was a lot of skepticism. And even when I was developing the shoe over the eight years it took to do that, um, a lot of experts in the ballet world told me, ah, oh, it can't be done. Um, there was actually, it was the medical people and the engineering types who were very supportive, fortunately. Um, so the ballet world was very skeptical at first. Uh, and in fact, I went, I went to a store in Chicago to try to get them to carry us. And they said, no, too expensive. That was another problem. And uh, so we decided to go right to the end user. So I went around to summer programs, serious ballet students go to, to dance camp in the summer. And again, before the internet and before cell phones, the directors of these programs were very happy to have someone come and entertain the girls at night. So I had a little lecture on the history of point work which segued into a presentation of the shoe, which segued into a, if you want to try it, I have to have some samples. And that got the ball rolling. And these serious accomplished students would then go back to their hometowns and persuade the local dancewear store to carry Gaynor Minden. So that was how we began to get into the dancewear stores. It took a, long, it took a while for the pros to accept us. And for that, I have to really give thanks to Jillian Murphy at American Ballet Theater. Jillian is a real, she's a very independent thinker, and she'd been wearing Gaynor Minden since she was a student, and she wanted to continue wearing them at ABT, and, uh, and she did. And because of that, it was okay to wear them at American Ballet Theater, and if it was okay to wear them at American Ballet Theater, they became much more accepted elsewhere. And in fact, we built our marketing campaign around this idea of the celebrity endorsement. And that was, at first I, I went out with all these common sense reasons why you should wear Gaynor Minden. Well, they're more durable, they'll save you money and they're more comfortable. Well, they didn't want comfort. And I, I wasn't allowed to say they protect against injury um, and they're quieter, but you know, all the practical reasons fell on deaf ears. It was the example of a respected and wonderful dancer that made all the difference. Well, I know you're not allowed to say protect against injury because of all sorts of, you know, sort of legal reasons, but I will say I always wondered as a ballet dancer why we had these shoes that had absolutely no support, were expected to jump as much as a basketball player, if not more so quickly. And, and the, the amount of abuse that our feet and legs go through constantly, the pounding, every night daily and it's amazing to think that nobody ever thought well maybe you should have a little bit more than just a slip of leather between your foot and the stage right um so i i know you're not allowed to say that it protects from injury but i can't imagine that it doesn't help because i got many stress fractures as a dancer all in my feet so i personally would have very much appreciated having a little bit more than just a slip of leather between my injury prone feet and the stage <laughs> Absolutely. Dancers are elite athletes, among the most elite in the world. What, what you do is so difficult and you have to do it while maintaining a serene and beautiful smile. You know, you're not even allowed to let the exertion show. Um, the dancers have to do it wearing a shoe that has, as you know, that has no right or left. They are longitudinally symmetrical and they were made for years out of these primitive materials that didn't protect the foot. And so it is my intention to use the shock absorbing materials to try to achieve that. And uh, our shock absorbing materials are found here. This is where you land from a jump, as you know, mm -hmm. throughout the lining of the shoe and uh, underneath the toe and underneath the heel. 
And this is a material that probably didn't exist to, you know, way back when, but thanks to the running boom of the 1980s, a lot of wonderful shock absorbing materials became available. And it was, it took a little research to find ones that would be effective and still be very, very thin because you can't make a big bulky, you, you can't wrap a sneaker, in, a sneaker in pink satin and say, it's a point shoe. Um, but they exist. There's some wonderful materials that will never bottom out, um, very resilient. And so that's that's what we use to make the shoes quiet and comfortable and we hope protective. Incredible. And so here you are with this incredible product. You're having all of the success selling your shoe to more and more ballet companies and dancers around the world. Uh, you know, it's just going up and up and up and up. And then COVID hits. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your experience with COVID, we know it hit the dance world terribly, right? Because performances were canceled and, and dancers were sent home to do class in their living rooms. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about how your company weathered uh, that experience. Oh, so we were we were we were riding high. We had had our best year ever. Our projections were making us so happy. We were in over 80 countries, as you say, over 200 companies in almost all the major companies. Um, things were, you know, in a full product line, not just point shoes. Things were looking really good. And we put together this wonderful team of about 40 employees who had gotten just so good at their jobs and so um, dedicated and talented. And then COVID hit and it was just devastating. And you know, all the performing arts just got clobbered by COVID. Um, but for us, it was theaters were closed, studios were closed, so kids couldn't take class, and the little dancewear stores were closed because they were non-essential businesses. And our, our boutique in New York was closed for that reason and just reopened about two weeks ago. Um, and to make matters worse, the factory in Massachusetts that had been our, our partner in developing the shoe to get it ready for production and had been making the shoes for us for almost 30 years. And I said, with such pride, our shoes are made in the USA. Um, they were shut down by the governor of Massachusetts. And by the time they were allowed to reopen, they couldn't. They, they, so they sold the building, auctioned off the equipment, let, you know, let all those people go. Um, and that was, th those were the two hardest days of my life when I had to lay off two thirds of my staff uh, and uh, and then when the factory closed, but, and I say I, but I must at this point point out that my husband John is my partner in the business. Um, I designed the shoe, but when it was ready to go on the market, John and I teamed up, and he fortunately had experience in marketing and in finance. And so while I do the design and the relationships with people in the dance world, John does just pretty much everything else. <laughs> so we had this, you know, we were in this terrible place. Fortunately, we had established a second supply in Eastern Europe because we saw we were growing so fast that, and so, so much that we would need another supplier. And we wanted them on the other side of the ocean so that we didn't have to do so much transoceanic shipping. And half of, more than half of our business is outside the US, it made sense. And they were just getting up to speed, but thank goodness they were there because that was how we were able to keep going. And then during the pandemic, when things were the most tightly shut down, um, we focused on our marketing. We kept those people. We had to let a number of our salespeople, we had to lay them off for a while. I'm glad to say we've been able to bring everybody back now, but um, we, we didn't have any shoes to sell and our factory was shut down and the dance floor shops were closed. There was no point in keeping the sales team on, uh, but the marketing people did, did a great job keeping us in the public, out there in the public eye. Um, they also arranged for our professional dancers, our celebrity endorsers, to teach class on Zoom. Dancers have to take, as you, you know, dancers have to take class every day. You cannot miss class. Um, and this was, you know, this is bad enough to, to have to do this in your living room, but to have to do it in isolation, you know, away from your colleagues and your friends. So by having these Zoom classes, we did create a bit of a community, and there was a certain amount of glamour in taking class with you know, a celebrity ballerina. And I think that if you add up all the dancers who took classes in all the classes, we reached over a quarter, we had over a quarter of a million classes out there for the first part of the pandemic. And that was, I think, good for everybody's morale and it helped, helped dancers stay in shape. Amazing, you really had a brilliant way of, of weathering it and getting through it. And we're so glad that you did and that, that you're back in, in a positive position. But talk to us a little bit, if you will, also Eliza, about the ways the dance world is changing and evolving, because I believe you are one of the only 
point shoe makers who carries a full range of skin tones for your point shoes, because if, if our viewers are not aware, the reason that the point shoe is pink, it's supposed to extend the line of the leg and make it all look longer. So that's why it's skin colored, right? So uh, when the dance world expands, uh, you need to also expand the number of point shoe offerings, the shades, correct? Eliza? Oh, yeah. And it's, it is more than just that, although you're, the beautiful pink dress you're wearing is a perfect example of ballet pink complementing the skin tones of people who have your skin color. But obviously it doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, ballet started out as an aristocratic pastime in royal palaces. You know, it has always been aristocratic, elite, white, European, and gendered. And the pandemic, I think, has given us an opportunity to pause for a moment. And now that things are getting back, um, as it has with so many other things, it is accelerating trends that were already there. So diversity and inclusivity is a huge one. That had already started. And as you were kind enough to say, Gaynor Minden was the first point shoe company to offer shades of brown as a stock shoe. Dangers had always been able to order them as a special order, which costs more money, or they would painstakingly apply makeup to their point shoes to get them to the skin color that more matched their own skin. But that is, you know, that's not exactly welcoming. You know, if you go into a dancewear shop and everything is is, is ballet pink, um, that's that sends, I think, a very unwelcoming message. Um, and an another thing that has happened that I'm glad to see is for a long time, some artistic directors insisted that everybody wear pink regardless of their skin tone. So dark-skinned dancers were forced to basically break the line. Ballet is all about line. Point shoes are to elongate the line. So if you are dark-skinned on top, but you're wearing pink tights and pink point shoes, then you know, you're not able to cre create your most beautiful possible line. So I'm really glad to see that that is changing. Um, inclusivity is also uh, accepting normally sized people. You know, for years, there were very unrealistic expectations for thinness and very unhealthy expectations. And I think ballet has recognized that and is addressing it and is, uh, is advising dancers to maintain a healthy weight and helping them do that. Yeah. So we have health and inclusivity. Um, other ways that dances is, I think, improving for the future. Um, is there, it's not as mean, you know, there used to be mean people in ballet, bullies, um, and that is no longer tolerated. And I, I don't think this is related necessarily, but a lot more women now have leadership positions in ballet. And that's a very positive change. Yeah. So there are- well, When you talk about meanies and bullies though, you make me think of the story you were saying earlier about uh, another um, unnamed point shoe company that has not been so happy about the, the rise of your point shoe company. And we should probably point out there are not so many point shoe companies in the world, right? We might be able to count them all on two hands. Uh, is that right? And, and, uh, and they're not so eager to let in another uh, competitor into the field. <laughs> well, nobody likes, you know, um, competition. And we, we entered, we, we kind of came out swinging and said, you know, these traditional point shoes last only one performance. And so we, we, we were not shy about pointing out the advantages of Gaynor Minden and the defects of the competition. But what, we, what, what, was, what happened with our Russian competitor was kind of funny. As part of our uh, celebrity endorsement program, when the principal dancer at the Bolshoi, or one of the principal dancers, there's several, started wearing Gaynor Minden and wore them at the Bolshoi Theater's grand reopening after a multi-million dollar refurbishment in 2011. She wore her Gaynor Minden point shoes. She signed with us. We put her beautiful picture in ads all over the place. Well, this, this was like stealing Helen of Troy. <laughs> Our Russian competitor just went ballistic. And so he started playing dirty. He commissioned a scientific study. And if you've never seen a Russian scientific study, it's, it's really something. It has all these stamps and seals and the biography of the chemist. And it goes on for pages and pages. And the study concluded that Gaynor Minden point shoes are hazardous to human health. <laughs> and he sent this study to companies and schools throughout the former Soviet Union and even to Western Europe, which is how we heard about it. So we had to go to our, our most expensive lawyers <laughs> to solve this one. And what they advised, and they were right, was to commission our own study 
with stamps and seals and chemists with impressive biographies. And our study proved that when used correctly, gainer mindens are perfectly safe. The problem with the Russian study was the methodology. What they did was they heated point shoes to 250 degrees centigrade, right? <laughs> That's broiling. And then they analyzed the smoke. You know, so what a, what a dirty trick. So we thought we had him kind of taken care of, but no. Um, he came back a while later with a, an article in a Moscow tabloid. I guess it's pretty easy to arrange for anything you want to appear in a newspaper to happen in Moscow. And this article was about these American point shoes that were gaining favor with the Russian ballerinas. And what a horrible thing that is, because these American point shoes are destroying the toes of our ballerinas. And that's no accident. It's a plot to undermine Russia's last great uh, cultural superiority. A CIA fact, plot. It's a CIA plot. That's exactly what they said. <laughs> oh, you have to love it. I mean, the ballet world is so cutthroat, right? <laughs> you, you, you knew you were going to totally escape unscathed, uh, especially from the, you know, some of the European companies that have, you know, been there forever. I, I for one, am so happy that your point you is doing so well, and that you're part of the, you know, the change in the zeitgeist in the ballet world. You know, I don't think we pointed this out, but the ballet shoe has not been changed since the 19th century. Um, and there are very few things that can't uh, they can't benefit from a little zhuzh, you know, from the 19th century. So I, I I'm hopeful that you will continue to spread the word with your shoes and also with your positive outlook for the ballet world, um, Eliza. And it's amazing. And where do you hope the company goes from here? What are your thoughts about the future? Well. Along some of the themes I mentioned before, um, ballet must become more diverse and more inclusive. And that's going to make it richer, more robust, more interesting, and more accessible. So Gaynor Minden is going to continue to support that with our products. Um, in the old days, dancers did not cross train. They did not lift weights. They did not do Pilates or do any of that stuff. In the old days, dancers lived on cigarettes and diet soda and were told, all you need to do is take class. You know, that was good enough for Margot Fontaine, but now ballet is so much dance is so much more challenging and demanding um, that dancers bodies really need what cross training and all these other uh, practices can do for them. So we make a number of products that support that that help that. Um, as I said, inclusivity goes just beyond goes beyond um, uh, a race. It also go, it also includes gender and we're seeing more and more men become interested in dancing on point. Yeah, and, no, and that's you know, right. Ballet Trocadero, Ballet exactly. Trocadero is completely on point. They, they oh. are among our favorite customers. They are hilarious. But as you know, they are all travesti. They put on tutus and tiaras and point shoes and they actually dance very, very well. They're really good. They are, um, they are excellent. But, I mean, yeah, no, you're right. And there's, um. Also, the the British ballet company. I can't remember their name. Um, yes, uh, Matthew Bourne. Yes, thank you. They're yeah. Also dancing um, so, but it, it's not just that. It's also um, men dancing on point for the same reasons that women do to create beautiful lines and sculpture. So it's not about dressing as women. It's about men dancing on point in their own right. And you know, there's a tradition of this in folk dancing. Georgian folk dancers do dance on their toes. The men do in these special boots that have a hard, hard toe box. And if you've never seen it, Google it, because they are great, the Georgian folk dancers, and they're, they're, they're exciting, they're ferocious. Amazing. Um, I, I, I mean, think men can do this. One thing um, that I want to ask you uh, is about the ability to special order your shoes, because I remember as a young dancer joining the New York City Ballet, one of the great sort of, uh, you know, exciting moments is when you get to order your first set of point shoes just to your shoes, your foot specifications. And uh, it was a real sort of, you know, coming of age moment. Uh, do you do special orders with dancers in companies? Um, like, especially when you talk about stars like Jillian Murphy, I'm sure they're very specific about how they want their point shoes uh, to be. They, they are. Um, most dancers don't need to because our fitting system, which was also an innovation, lets everyone specify quite a few of the dimensions. You can specify the length, you can specify the width, you can specify the toe box, and that's the injection molded part that I mentioned before, but we make it in you know, various different 
uh, sorry, stiffnesses, so that dancers have a lot of options that way. You also specify the vamp and the height of the heel and the model. So you can't really see it in an empty shoe, but shoes can have a, a sort of an hourglass shape. They can have a U shape. They can have a really knife edge heel. So dancers can specify all that without a special order. Okay, if right. they still want something different, yes, we are happy to do that. Right, right. Amazing. Well, I mean, I, I just think that uh, that what you're doing is so incredible. And I do think that, um, you know, there there probably is no reason that all dancers should not be using canter bindens. I mean, I'm sure this is, tradition is one of the biggest parts of ballet and people just like you said, just get used to a certain shoe hurting or feeling a certain way. Um, but there really is no there's no reason to be in pain, um, but but it does bring you to um, another point, which is that you do need a certain amount of training and a certain uh, you know years of dance training before you can be on point any kind of point to even a point to as comfortable as yours. Um, so to that point, you don't ever envision selling your shoes freely without a fitting or at a store where someone can can professionally or or expertly fit the shoe. Correct. No, they really must, must, must be fitted by a trained point shoe fitter. And this may be one of the reasons, I say touching wood, that so far the big guys like Nike have not done this because it's the fitting of them is just so fussy. Uh, you have to go to a store and be fitted by the fitter there. Or we've actually gotten pretty good at doing online fittings as part of the pandemic. But again, it's a trained fitter looking at the dancer and at the shoe on her foot. And that's that's essential. And so is having enough strength and technique to be able to hold yourself up on point. It's not just uh, putting on a point shoe, going up there and, and parking. You know, you're you are actively, as you know, you're actively engaged in, in engaging your muscles, lifting up out of the shoe, using your turnout, uh, uh, you know, bringing everything to bear on this. And that just takes that just takes some practice and getting used to. So no. Uh, beginners are not allowed to put on point shoes till they've had several years of training and shown a real commitment. Right. And so because of that, because this is sort of a, you know, a, a limited market, right? There's only so many dancers in the world that are trained enough to, to wear your shoes. I mean, even though, of course, every year a new girl, uh, a new little girl becomes old enough and trained enough to buy herself a pair of point shoes, but still it is somewhat of a limited market. So when you think about, um, growing the market is it is it just about getting more of the share of dancers that are out there in the world there's certainly getting yeah, more market share mm -hmm. um, and expanding into other products for dancers right. our motto is we help dancers thrive and yeah. so as long as it helps dancers thrive we're interested in developing it yeah Right. Well, I see Wendy has popped up, which means there are some questions from the audience so I Wendy I will let you uh, dive right in. Sure, thank you so much, Tanya. Okay, so um, lots of great questions coming in here. Um, Eliza, you just answered the first question that came in from Alden Richards. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about with regards to Gaynor Minden and what the future holds for the company? Uh, two, two quick things. One is that as we do more and more direct to consumer and more and more online, I would love to develop an app for point shoe fitting. Right. So if anybody out there can make it an app that can do a proper foot scan and give that information to uh, a, a computer program that can turn it into a point shoe specification, please get in touch with me. And the okay. other thing I want to mention is that the pandemic had me had us all really worried um, for many reasons. And one was that I was concerned that there might be a cohort of young dancers who were not going to come back. And, and we know that that some have are not going to come back. But that makes me very sad because ballet training is so good for young people. And even if you never become a professional, even if you never wear point shoes, what ballet gives young people is in addition to physical strength and flexibility and poise and grace and musicality, it gives them the patience to persevere when something is difficult. Um, it makes them stand up straight. It makes them courteous and, and punctual. Um, almost all the almost all our employees at Gaynor Minden are current or former dancers. In fact, I think my husband, John, and our shipping manager are maybe the only ones who are not. And dancers make the best employees. So I, I encourage people to do it, even if you have stage fright and never want to perform. Excellent. Um, another question uh, from Eva. 
do celebrity do the celebrity dancers use off the shelf shoes or are they customized? I'm not sure. She she said off the shelf GM shoes or are they customized? So maybe the two of you understand that question better than I do as a non dancer. I think yeah, that I think was the question with that. that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was Tanya's question about special orders. Um, okay. I'd say, yeah, I'd say most of our big name pros do get some customization. Often okay. it has to do with changing the cut of the satin on the outside or making this a little longer or this a little higher or a little lower. Okay, a um, couple questions here. One from Eric. For decades, ski boots have been made by molding them to the skier's foot. Is your fitting system analogous to, in any way to the manner in which I get my ski boots fitted? Oh, I'm so glad someone asked me about ski boots because that was a big part of my inspiration. My first pair of ski boots was leather, leather lace up ski boots. I don't know if anybody else remembers that. And I remember when plastic ski boots first came out, I, was, I remember I was at a cocktail party with my parents and all the adults were rolling their eyes and oh, can you imagine how ridiculous well, then racers started winning races in their plastic ski boots, and then they totally replaced the leather ones. And that was always one of the reasons that I felt that, that this could be done. Um, I remember how they were mocked when they first came out and how they triumph in the end. As far as molding to the shape of the foot, that's something we really can't do in a point shoe. For one reason, our wall thicknesses are, are, are like nothing. You know, I have barely an eighth of an inch here. Um, barely an eighth of an inch under the foot. And the kinds of foams and materials that will conform to a foot and take a mold like that, I think they call it flow, need to be thicker. You need like a one inch wall thickness for that. And then with the, with the ballet shoe, you've got no right and left, which is part of the look. You know, the long line of the leg has no, is, is not asymmetrical. Um, and that, you know, to keep that tapered look, we just don't have room for the wall thickness. And um, there's, there's no way to get the right and left. So dancers just have to kind of put their foot into the toe box and, and deal with it. Excellent. Um, another question from Suzanne. Eliza, we're curious about your opinion of how early in age dancers should go on point with Gaynor Mindens. We've heard age 12 recommended in general. You wanna weigh in on that? Yeah, this is not just Gaynor Minden. This is any point shoot. Um, the dancer should be have enough strength and technique that she can do certain things. And there are criteria that you can look up and, and some teachers say, you know, can she do this many releves? Can she do various other technical things? Um, a lot of it is mental. Is she really committed to ballet? Is she actually taking class three or four times a week? How's her attitude when she's in class? It's too bad I'm saying she, because I would like ballet to include men one of these days. Um, the issue with going on point too soon is that a dancer who, who goes on point without proper strength and technique can, yes, damage her feet. Um, if she has sufficient strength and technique, it's okay. And that's why an adult who takes up point at say, you know, age 25 is less likely to damage her foot, even if she's not that, that proficient yet, because her bones have set and no, it's not great, but she's not going to hurt herself. But for a child whose bones have not yet finished developing, she's got to be able to engage her muscles and use her turnout correctly. Excellent. Um, one thing before I go on to the next question, um, Eliza, you have a book that you've written. Yes. Oh, thank you. I do. Okay. It's called, it's called The Ballet Companion. It is a reference book for ballet students by Simon and & Schuster. And um, I, I was an English major. And I always wanted to write a book. Um, so I was surprised and delighted when a book developer called me up because she had a dancing daughter and she went to get a book for her daughter and found nothing that had any visual interest or that seemed particularly engaging. And so she offered to do this and have it ghostwritten for me. And I said, oh no. <laughs> well, did you know? I was going to ghostwrite anything to write for me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, Eva would like to know why your shoes are pre-arched. When, when a dancer gets a conventional point shoe, which is flat across the bottom, she breaks it in to suit herself. And Tanya, I'm sure you did this oh, yes. thousands of times. You break them and then you knock them against the wall or the floor yeah. multiple times to make them softer and keep, get the noise down. <laughs> and Gaynor Mindens come with a 
with this insert that does not change or weaken or deteriorate. In fact, we had it flex tested and it went over 250,000 cycles without even fatiguing or weakening. And this, this shoe is not gonna break in or change. And for that reason, we put an arch in it already because a dancer cannot bend it and have it, she can't bend it the way she can bend a traditional shoe and have it kind of remember that shape and work for her. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Helen. How do you feel about Gaynor Minden shoes for dancers starting point? I've heard different schools of thought, traditional point shoes for dancers to roll up versus popping up in Gaynor Minden shoes. The question, that question comes down to stiffness. Any shoe that is overly stiff can allow the dancer to, to cheat, to just kind of sit on her shoes and, and not engage her muscles correctly. So you have to have a shoe that is the right that, that makes the dancer work hard enough, not so hard that her that her toes begin to hurt or she's injured, but one that requires her to, to be working her feet. And if you put on a shoe that is too hard uh, and it's a traditional shoe, that's not going to be a problem for very long because that traditional shoe is going to start breaking in. But if you put on a gainer minden that's too stiff and too hard, it's never going to break in or change. And the dancer could find herself with a shoe that's doing the work for her for months and months. It can also kind of pop her up on point in an uncontrolled way. So our big, one of our big marketing challenges in recent years has been to make dancewear stores and dancers aware of the fact that we make five different options for stiffness. You know, these, these things that I keep holding up, we make five of them. And, but most, many stores don't particularly want to stock five different options in every size and style is too many. So they just stock the harder ones because they think that's what people want. And many dancers who are not familiar with Gaynor Minden have said, oh, give me your stiffest shank because I break shoes like this. You know, my arches are so strong. I need your stiffest shank. And we say, well, no, actually, you're, you can't break this. And you might be happier with something that's a little more flexible. And they don't always believe that. So a lot of dancers got fitted in shoes that were too stiff for them. And we've actually had to do a fair bit of, of explaining and communicating to make dancers understand that no, they should take the shoe that is the perfect flexibility when it's brand new, because it's not gonna change. That's a complicated message. You know, It doesn't fit easily on one line. Yeah. Right, okay. The question from Jesse, um, uh, I'm not, uh, Jesse, forgive me if I don't say this word correctly. Is labanotation something used in ballet or is it a joke? Are either of you familiar with this term? Yeah, labanotation is a way of noting down uh, choreography. It's really, really, this is one of the great challenges before video. And even with video, it's not always perfect all the time. Um, great dances have been lost. The rite of spring was lost because there was no dance notation to record what the movements were and where the dancers needed to be on the stage and how that corresponded to music. So Laban came up with Laban notation, which is a system for doing this. And there's another system as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a real challenge. And I don't know if, if anyone in the audience has ever heard Professor Tufty, who's a Yale professor, who's a brilliant uh, guy. And he, he's, his specialty is the uh, presentation of quantitative information. And he acknowledges that this is one of the great challenges is dance notation. So yeah, it's out there, but it's not often used. And what, as a practical matter, what people do is set up a couple of video cameras, maybe yeah. even three, and try to record things that way. Is that, is that what you did, Tanya? Yeah, no, I mean, at the New York City Ballet and at many ballet companies with long traditions, ballets are literally handed down from ballet master to ballet mistress to dancer. I mean, they sit there in the studio and teach the steps from memory, right? Because they danced it so many times themselves. Now you can rely on videotapes. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. But before there was a videotape option, ballets were literally just handed down by memory. So um, there hasn't been any really accepted. I mean, I think very few ballet companies know how to you know, uh, transfer ballets through lab notation. I think it's a very sort of specific uh, skill. I think that most ballet companies still use memory from ballet mistresses and ballet masters, um, but then also videotapes now we have those. 
but you're right. It's it's an interesting uh, dilemma, right? You can write music down. You can you can make you can write a score, but you can't really, you know, it's not universally accepted any method of writing down ballets. So, okay. um, thank you both for that. Uh, so I have a question here from Karen. Would Gainer Minden shoes be adopted by young dancers at the same point in training as traditional point shoes? Yeah, sure. And again, as long as they're correctly fitted and the appropriate stiffness for, for any dancer. Okay, thank you. Um, Eva, I'll get to your question in a moment. Um, Eliza, I have a question for you, um, something that I'm interested in just sort of as a, a consistent theme of entrepreneurship that I've seen. Um, we haven't talked much about your husband, John Minden, class of 82, who is the CEO of Gainer Minden. Um, and many of the entrepreneurs that I encounter through Accelerate Yale are, they're still at the point where they are the only founder. Um, and maybe they're looking for a co-founder or they may not be aware of why they would need a co-founder. So can you talk a little bit about the process that you went through to, to realize that you would be better off with a co-founder. Um, in this case, it happened to be John, your husband. Um, so, and if you could tell us a little bit more about that process and, and why you think that, that that has contributed to the success of Gainer Minden. But John never gets all the credit he should get. He, does, he just doesn't get the credit he deserves. And I'm the one who gets to come out and do lovely events like this and talk to the public about ballet, whereas he's making everything go quietly from his office. Um, I, I did the development, as I said, for the eight years leading up to this, because I had the ballet experience and the knowledge and also the familiarity with manufacturing. But when it came time to bake it into a business, that was a skill set and experience that he had a lot more of than I did. He's also a very, very accomplished marketer. He was a marketing consultant before we teamed up, and he had a hunch that the Internet might amount to something. And so he secured the domain name dancer.com. And we were the first point shoe company with a website. So John's you know, creative, John is an innovator in, in, in a business way too. Um, we work very well together because we rarely overlap. You know, his, his sphere of authority and influence is, is really pretty separate from mine. We come together on marketing decisions, uh, on hiring decisions. But he pretty much runs the business side and handles the relationships with the many shops and distributors who carry our shoes now all over the world. Interesting. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, <laughs> a question from Eva. Why do you think New York City Ballet uses only Freed? That's a question for Tanya. <laughs> yes, I, I will say it goes, it goes back to... Um, tradition, there's a little bit of an, a, a romantic notion, you know, Freed, uh, you, when you special order your shoe as a dancer at, at the New York City Ballet or whatever other companies use Freed as their company shoe, you get a maker, right? So he has a stamp, which is either a spade or a star or a horseshoe, whatever it may be and you choose your maker. So there's a little bit of like a romantic relationship with your maker, who is this person that you can imagine in your head is this little old elf-like man slaving away at his at his studio table somewhere in London or wherever, Free, you know, where Freedom London is based. Of course, I'm sure it looks nothing like that, but there's, there's a little bit of this romanticized notion of your relationship with your point shoemaker, <laughs> right? Um, and you all, you try different makers until you find the one who's your soulmate. <laughs> um, and, you know, everything about the way that maker makes your shoe is different, even though the specifications are exactly the same, another maker would make that shoe differently. So it's this, this sort of romantic tradition that's gone on and on and on and on. And then on top of that, I'm sure there might be a business reason for it that the dancers don't even know about that has to do with the deal that the company gets with Freed of London, which of course is not romantic at all, but is something that we're not aware of as, as, as dancers. And actually maybe Eliza, you know a little bit more about how that works. Um, but because we order so many shoes, as Eliza pointed out, we go through a pair of shoes of performance when you use Freed. Um, and you, or, you hundreds and hundreds of shoes you get just 
for you, for you as a dancer every season. Um, and so I don't know what the financial implications of that are. I don't know, there must be a huge, a huge deal. Um, but it doesn't still seem to make sense to me when you step out of you step out of that romantic box and look at it with a cynical eye. It really doesn't seem to make sense, but it's it's just been that way ever ever thus. And I think a lot of dancers are again attached to their maker. They feel very attached to that person. Um, so they might not want to change because of that. But I don't know what the financial implications are. Maybe Eliza, you know better about that. Um, I, I, I know some, and, and yes, there are some. <laughs> uh, City Ballet is right now, as far as I know, the only major company where they're really all the English paste shoe, the, the single use point shoe all the time, but that's changing. You know, a dancer at City Ballet is trying our shoes right now. And in the past, Alexandra Ancinelli wore them. So it's, um, it's, it's not absolute. And I think it's changing. And I think as attitudes change and, um, and well, Balanchine has been dead for 40 years. So I think the dancers there who were so attached to what they thought he wanted, um, they retired. Uh, so I, I, I think they'll come around. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. Like anything, the change, change is on the horizon. <laughs> Um, I have a couple more questions for you, Eliza. One, actually, this this is sort of a big, rather simple question, but I'm curious to hear your answer. Um, how do you think, if at all, your Yale experience may have influenced you to start this company and build it to what it is today? Uh, part of the reason that I'm asking that is a question, it's a question that we often ask our guests, but at the time that you and John left Yale, entrepreneurship really wasn't celebrated in the way that it currently is um, at Yale. So I'm just curious, why did you decide to like pursue this very uncharted path? Um, and how did your experience at Yale factor into that, if at all? Oh, um, s several reasons. Um, Yale taught us to think critically, or at least it did when, <laughs> when I was there. So it taught us to question authority respectfully um, and to not just accept the status quo because some authority figure or some expert said it had to be a certain way. Um, on campus, vigorous debate was encouraged. It was okay to hold a position that might be controversial as long as you could defend it, again, with courtesy and, and ideally with a little wit. Um, there were some really wonderful debates and discussions um, that that got me thinking about challenging authority. Um, the other thing that Yale did for me as an English major was it taught me to write well. And that became very important when I had to present myself on paper to in, in these very male dominated worlds, you know, the injection molding, plastic shoemaking, um, being able to write well gave me some legitimacy because I was only I was only 25, you know, so 25 year old women are not necessarily going to be taken seriously when they walk into a factory. And then finally, uh, one of my favorite English courses was Professor Broadhead's American Literature. And we were reading Fenimore Cooper, The Last of the Mohicans. And Professor Broadhead told us a story about Cooper, who apparently had been kicked out of Yale. I don't know what he was expelled for, but he was kicked out. Anyway, Cooper was, apparent, was supposedly reading one night at home a novel that had just come out. And he thought it was pretty terrible. So he threw it in the fire and said, you know, even I can do better than this. So I kind of had, after I cut open all those shoes on my brother's bandsaw, I kind of had this Fenimore Cooper moment of even I can do better than this. I see. Okay, excellent. Right. And uh, uh, another question that I had for you is, uh, we have many, many uh, entrepreneurs in the audience, aspiring entrepreneurs, and uh, a lot of people who are at, very, at the very early stages of building their businesses, in addition to many experienced people, what advice would you give to the folks who are in those early stages who have a long road and very kind of, uh, un, uh, I guess, unclear path ahead of them? You, Because you certainly navigated that kind of road. So what kind of advice would you give to the entrepreneurs who are currently watching this event? Perseverance, perseverance, perseverance and more perseverance. Um, and the other thing is I was very lucky and I bet every, you know, every entrepreneur says, oh, I was very lucky. Um, and, I, and indeed I was, and we found the factory that made our shoes in Massachusetts for so many years because my father happened to be sitting next to a friend at lunch who knew a guy 
who knew this guy who knew a factory in Massachusetts that made shoes for brides and bridesmaids and the satin shoes were a perfect fit, you know, that kind of coincidence. Mm -hmm. So put yourself out there where luck is most likely to find you, you know, don't, don't shut yourself up in your attic. You got to, you got to get out there and, uh, you know, walk, walk in the middle of the path and hope that the, the arrows of luck will, will come to you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Tanya, do you have any last questions before I kind of wind things down here? No, I just, uh, you know, I just want to say how refreshing it is to see, you know, the the ballet world changing in ways that are that are healthy and fruitful uh, and inclusive. And I thank you, Eliza, for being a part of that change. Um, it can only benefit this beautiful and traditional art form. Well, thank you, Tanya, for a lovely interview. And thank you, Wendy, for making this happen. Oh, of course, my pleasure. I, I, want, I want to give a little shout out to Ed Sevilla, uh, who I, I need to thank for introducing me to Eliza. I was so captivated by her story. Here she is today. Um, so a few announcements before I let all of you go. One is that uh, our next event is scheduled for September 6th at 8 p.m. Uh, from Yale to Unicorn. That will be an interview with Justin Borgman, who is uh, a graduate of SOM. He is the co-founder and CEO of Starburst. So uh, please mark your calendars for that. And we will be putting out publicity for that uh, just after Labor Day. Um, secondly, our next newsletter is coming out mid-August. So if you have any news you would like us to drop in there or any kind of information that you might have seen about cool startups in the Yale ecosystem, um, any interesting raises, any interesting uh things that you've seen in the Yale ecosystem, please email those to us at team at accelerateyale.org. Um, I would say by August 10th, if you can. Um, finally, I just want to thank uh, Yale Women for co-sponsoring tonight's event, as well as Yale Museums, Arts and Culture, and YAA shared interest groups without whom these events would not be possible. We're so grateful for your support. And finally, Eliza, Tanya, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was such a treat to hear from both of you. You both inspire me um, every day. Uh, and I'm just so honored that both of you could join us for this evening's event. Um, this will be, uh, this event is recorded and it will be posted and shared to our socials and also shared to everybody who registered for tonight's event. So keep an eye out for that. Okay. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Thanks to everyone for joining us tonight and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.